How are you? Have you wake, woken up yet? Not too cold? Yeah? You're a little bit, you're surprisingly shy and quiet this year, but you know, hopefully I'm going to be able to wake you up a bit. So um, I had the pleasure of being your Stein's colleague for several years, uh, but now I'm in a startup. Luckily, we're not just four people anymore, we're 11. And just for context, what we do is we make a tool for video calls. And tools for making video calls is not a very new idea. You might think that I thought that already existed. It does, but specifically, specifically what we're doing is we're making a tool for video calls for doctors. So for instance, uh, you could have a video call with your uh, general practitioner, but you know what? That's not a very new idea either. Video calls have been around for a long time. Doctors have been along for a, around for a long time. And the idea of combining them two have also been, along, uh, been around for a really long time. This slide says 1954. And what I love about it is that 1954 is here in the future. So this is the prediction about the future, 1954 when teledoctoring will replace inefficient house calls. Um, and it's 2019. Now, it's not really something you typically do do a video call with your doctor. And I think that might be because video calls are very often, they feel like this. There you go. You, you stole the Medusa serum? Well, stole the serum, saved the day, did your job for you, call it what you wish. Debbie, Dave, Dave, he hacked into our system. Where's the sound? Da Dave, I can't hear. Your microphone can't hear is it's not on. Click on the button with the picture of the microphone. Every time a villain calls in, this happens. Hello, hello. Well, now we can so hear annoying. you, but every we cannot see. You. Every time. Oh, that's like talking to my parents. It's always How about now? Yes. Oh yes, yes. we've got you. That's fantastic. Now where was I? <laughs> And uh, since you're all laughing, it, it probably means that you can recognize the situation. So the fact that video calls suck is such a mainstream feeling that it's a joke in a Pixar movie. So why would doctors ever want to do video calls? They obviously suck. They suck so much that you, you're even laughing at it. How are we then supposed to convince doctors to do video calls? And if you've been paying uh, attention the other days, it might also sound like we have a problem and we're trying to sell something that people don't really want. Um, but there's also this other feeling that sometimes people mention, well, don't you just like, need some early adopters? And this obviously is the future. You know, why shouldn't you do video calls? Like, why do I have to go all to the doctor's office? This expectation that it should somehow solve itself. A problem in the way that we talk about technology is, is often almost treated as this natural force. Technology just comes sweeping over us, and there's some innate quality of the technology that makes it a fact it's just going to come sooner or later, and you just got to deal with it. Um, the internet is here to stay. Very often when people say X is here to stay and you just have to deal with it, people trying to critique technology, for, uh, for instance, are often seen as naive. Technology is often seen as something we cannot shape, that we cannot regulate, that we can't affect. And do you know, looking at technology as something that's not possible to shape, that you just have to deal with, where does that get us? Thinking. It only, the only people who earns on us thinking about technology is something that cannot be shaped or formed or regulated or shaped, and we don't remember that technology is actually built by people, are really big tech companies. And from like an ethical or a political or societal perspective, I really don't want to live in a world where we think about technology as something that cannot be tamed. And technology can be tamed. One thing that's really great that happened to, uh, la really late last night is the Fedora cyclists finally have the rights for a proper uh, salary. Because they said, we don't care it's a tech company. We still want a proper salary. And I applaud them for it. You can join me if you want to. <laughs> Yay. Go unions. <laughs> But also, if we're making technology, if I think that there's just something innate with video calls that um, think that, well, you know, if video calls and doctors were a good idea, it should have happened already. 
and I should just give up because there was something about the technology in itself. If it was a good enough idea, it would just have spread itself by now. So that's why I want to talk about bicycles. A very complex technology. So I want you all to close your eyes and imagine a bicycle. Picture a bicycle. You're not closing your eyes. Close your eyes and picture a bicycle. And then you may open your eyes. Is this what you pictured? No. no. Uh, and if at first glance at this bicycle, you might be like, isn't it weird how bad they were at building bicycles in the, eight, the end of the 1800s? Like, they were already, already way past like, the Industrial Revolution, and you can make such a crappy bicycle. What was wrong with them? But, you know, that's often like their first impression. And then we try to figure out, well, what happened with the bicycle? It's often presented as this like, linear evolutionary thing. They started up with this weird thing. There's this monstrosity that starts looking like something we might recognize as a bike. And then you have this one. By 1886, we have bikes. And we're like, OK, this looks correct. I like this. I'm at ease now. But if you think about it, the first thing, like, how is that the first bike that you saw was not a fluke. You might look at the first bike and think that that looks very impractical for bringing my kids to kindergarten or going grocery shopping or stopping on the red light. But you know what? You weren't supposed to do any of those things with that bike. I'm going to show you an ad. This is from uh, 1890. These ads are next to each other in the newspaper. And you can ask yourself, do you want to ride the Eagle? Or are you a pussy who needs a safety bicycle? <laughs> the reason the bike looked like this <laughs> was because it went really fast. This was a bike for young, macho men who loved speed and adventure. And the only thing that's changed here is how we look at bikes. Um, and you, there's nothing linear or logical about this process. The reason you could have these two bikes at the same time is because people were negotiating and competing about what is a bike? What should it look like? Who should use it? How should we use it? What's a good way? What, is even, what even is our idea of a bike? And there's this super nerdy article from the uh, research article from the 1980s where they document how messy the development of the bike really was. If you zoom in on it, there were loads of different social groups that had different needs. There were different problems. There were different technological solutions um, for how the bike should be built. For instance, uh, the air tires were first made to uh, reduce the vibration problem, make it more comfortable to bike. But it turned out those bikes were also faster when they had air tires instead. A huge technological challenge that they had it was really hard. They never found a solution to it. They were working really hard on it. Was how the heck they could build a bicycle a woman could use. It was a huge problem. The technological challenge they had was how you make a bicycle without exposing a woman's ankles. And this is a good example. Sometimes we look at something as a technological problem, and it ended up having a social or cultural solution. We just decided ankles are OK, and women can wear pants, and now you don't need to make a tricycle for women, because that's actually what they were biking at the time. If you want to geek out, here's the original article. Uh, it's a classic. You should read it. Um, but even more so, um, even with the bike, it seems like we landed on something here, I guess, in 1890. Technology continuously keeps changing. The way we look at it, the ethics, the morals, the values around us in, is constantly being debated. For instance, a few years ago, it maybe was weirder to be biking in wintertime. Or say, oh, my family, we don't have a car. I drive my kids to kindergarten with an electrical bike, for instance. Or I could do bulk shopping with my bike. Or transport something weighing 300 kilos. But again, using bikes for transporting heavier stuff is also not a new idea. And um, the second we look at the development of technology as something logical, where each step will bring us closer to the one truth about how the technology should be used, uh, we're going to lose. And in conferences like these, conferences about innovation and technology, luckily not so much on this one, there's a lot of hype. But not so much about how those things are hyped eventually become habits that we have. Uh, you might be familiar with the hype cycle. Uh, one of the things I can read about here is peak hype digital twin. I have no idea what that is. 
I'm not quite sure what a virtual assistant is, but I hope I never need one. Um, and as you see, it's full of detail when it's on this peak of inflate, uh, inflated expectations. But then it takes maybe two years, three years, five years, 20 years, 30 years till we get to this plateau of productivity. But how the heck did we get there? I've, there's like almost no stories about how you went from having this technological new idea to how it was actually suddenly a thing that we took for granted and used in everyday life. So there's a different uh, theory here. It's called domestication theory, also from uh, sociology. Uh, originally, the word comes from what we do with animals, like the wolf became a dog. And the thing is that the, the wolf adapted to us, but also we adapted to them. After all, we're walking after them and picking up their shits. So it goes both ways. People adapt and the technology adapts. Um, and you can use this as a metaphor also for understanding how technology becomes habits in people's lives or not. So I'll take the doctor as an example again. An example of a technology that they have fully domesticated is the telephone. There are no big debates or moral discussions about whether a phone has anything to do in a doctor's office and whether this is OK that doctors use phones. But they do have similar discussion when it comes to video calls. And if you're trying to introduce new technologies, you have to understand this process um, to make it work. And it's also to understand this process of how people make habits out of new technology. It's not something you can do from your office. You have to go out and observe it. But this is a doctor's office. This is a doctor's office. This is also a doctor's office. The world is a lot more varied than we like to think. This is my favorite doctor's office. I wish I had a doctor who had a skeleton with a fireman's helmet, but I just get to visit them. Because uh, they, um, in diffusion theory, uh, you don't get into the detail of everything that happens from you to when the second that you get the technology to when it's actually something people use. You know, some people acquire a technology. What led to them acquiring it in the first place? Was it because we sent them a bunch of shit in the, in the mail or started knocking on their doors? Was it because they read about it in the newspaper? Was it because a colleague talked about, regardless of how this happened, they're going to have a bunch of concerns. Should they even acquire this new thing? So what you could do if you're trying to spread a new product or a new technology to understand this phase is to think, why should target groups be, even be interested in the product at all? thinking about how and from who they're likely to hear about the product. And also, the essential thing is, like, what are they skeptical about? Are those concerns, are they practical? Or are they more value-based? Is it about morals or ethics? Because that's often something that could stop a technology from spreading in the first place and thinking about how your product addresses this. But even if you solve this thing, people actually buy the thing, take it home. There's, uh, that doesn't mean they immediately start using it. The next step is often called objectification. So what's the role you assign to this technology? How is it made visible to the surroundings? I'm going to use the doctors here as an example. Is this a doctor's office that will share it on their social media and hang up posters? And also looking at the kind of language that they use. Um, so we have one doctor who's like, talk to your doctor from your home, your cabin, work, or on travel. Like, sounds very nice and cozy, and like, you should start doing this. And this other doctor is like, these consultations are made available when it's urgent to talk to a doctor without the health problems to requiring immediate help. So I guess that means if it's urgent but not urgent, I'm not sure, or drop in. Uh, so this will kind of make, set the stage for how they will even start using the technology. So what kind of language do your users use about the product? How do they present it to the surroundings? How have they, like, have they casted a role for the technology? And could you somehow create content or artifacts that can guide users in finding that role? And then comes the very critical step, because they haven't started using the thing uh, yet. The key thing is whether they're able to find room for the technology in their workday and routines. So here are two examples of different doctors. This one doctor's office had thousands of video calls. Uh, it turned out they'd made like this drop-in thing. P patients could just show up uh, and half an hour after lunch every day, and then he would talk to them. Whereas this other doctor is saying, this is super inefficient. I, maybe I'm a dinosaur, but I don't think this is the future. 
And what it turned out is that typically doctors have 20 minute slots or 15 minute slots. A typical consultation might be shorter, might be longer, but it's roughly about that length. But it turns out the video calls were shorter than typical consultations. So if you did video calls in the schedule, you would feel like you were wasting your time. You would have a lot of tid, is what they said. So the ones that turned out could actually integrate it and started using were the ones that had the video calls back to back because then it felt more efficient. They would have it like in half an hour after 3 o'clock, and they would just call the patient then. A another hassle turns out those, they were afraid they didn't have enough USB ports in their computers. So we figured out, OK, we buy them USB ports so they are not afraid of unplugging the wrong thing, and they can plug in a web camera. So you need to map all of the possible hurdles, big and small, even the tiniest ones that might stop them from efficiently establishing a habit. And trying to learn what characterizes the users that build such a habit and those that don't, and see if there are insights from that that you can use to improve the product. And finally, even if people do build a habit, as I mentioned with the bikes, um, continuously people will be debating norms and values governing how technology is being used. This is happening among physicians now when it comes to video calls, but it's also the same like with smartphones. We're still negotiating. Is it okay to text someone during dinner and you're sitting with someone else? Or is it okay to pick up a phone during a restaurant call? Um, and I think you have to realize as the creator of the product, you're only one of very many parties that will have opinions on how and why the product should be used and try to see what you can learn from your opponents rather than thinking, well, I had the idea, I'm right, and everyone else just need to deal with the future or something like that. Technology is not a natural force. It's not something that just comes sweeping up, uh, over us that we just have to deal with. It's something we shape, and we have to take the responsibility that comes with that. Thank you. <laughs>